Hi, this is Evelyn Lopez. Welcome to Sustainability in Your Ear, the Earth911.com podcast for the week of April 1st, 2019. We are recording at the lovely and delightful Moonyard Recording Studio in Tacoma, Washington. With the fabulous engineer. With our fabulous engineer, Doug Mackey. It is April 1st, but don't be fooled. Today we're going to talk about green myths, falsehoods, and greenwashing. So today we have uh, Mitch Ratcliffe, our Earth 901 publisher. Mitch, where are you today? I know you're not in the studio sitting across from me. No, I'm not, and, and uh, I am sitting and working in my home office, good. beavering away on the future of Earth 911. Oh, very good. That sounds exciting. We also have two of our Earth 911 writers, Sarah Lozanova and Trey Granger. Sarah, where are you today? I am in sunny Midcoast, Maine. Okay, so I got to know, still snow on the ground, or have you turned the corner to spring? Um, there's still big heaps of mm-hmm. ice and snow, but the the ground is thawing, so the end of... End of winter is in sight. Ah, so nice to hear. And Trey, where are you today? I am in Metro Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, I'm curious, are either of you, Doug or Evelyn, or sorry, Mitch or Evelyn, going to watch this Tacoma FD show that will have already debuted by the time this podcast airs, but I keep seeing ads (laughs) for it on the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I don't know. It's on True TV, and I don't get cable anymore. I just uh, stream stuff, so I haven't decided if it's something... That I can get very easily, but a couple of places around town are doing a a showing of it. Um, So I would say the citizens of Tacoma are sort of cautiously uh, interested in this program, afraid that they're going to be making fun of us and saying stupid things, but also somewhat delighted to have a show focused on Tacoma. What do you say, Doug? Uh, I'll be watching, you know videos about archaeology and okay. Nova and stuff like that. But that's just me. Okay. That's I, just you know, I, I, I cut the cord and I, I don't even know how to get it. So, uh, but on the other hand, um, as a resident of Lakewood, which has appeared on cops more than any other city in the United States, oh. uh, <laughs> it's, it's, in, it's intriguing to see Tacoma getting its due. Yeah, in a in a more positive way than being on cops. Hopefully so. Hopefully so. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe the tagline is "fighting fires in America's wettest city." Yeah, I think that's I think that's their idea. You know, and uh, I have to say, I don't I think, think you know city. we we're not the wettest city. I think you know Forks is perhaps or something else. But um, yes, Forks is. But you know, actually, uh, New York gets more rain on an annual basis. Oh, than, they, they just get it more yeah. concentrated. Yeah, yeah. it's. Uh, it's interesting. I know I actually had an opportunity to talk to some firefighters a couple of years ago, and I asked them, you know, what percent of their time was spent fighting fires. And it's not all that high, but they're out almost, you know, multiple times during the day on um, I- incidents where people are in car accidents or in yeah. distress. So, I mean, they're pretty busy, even if they're not actually fighting a whole lot of fires. Well, let's uh, before we get into talking about April Fools and how not to be fooled, um, Mitch. Any good interviews coming up on the web on the website? Yeah, we've got one uh, that just went up uh, uh, prior to this show uh, with uh, Sauna Packaging. We were talking with the founders uh, Ron ba- uh, Basic Smith and James Eichner about cannabis packaging. Uh, so they're doing sustainable cannabis packaging using a combination of. Um, Hemp-derived plastic and ocean-recovered plastic. Hmm. Uh, so these these are reused and, and reusable uh, packaging for, for various forms of cannabis. It was an interesting conversation because there are actually, you know, child protection laws in terms of packaging that limit the use of recycled materials. Uh, so it was, a, it was a very interesting discussion. And uh, later this week, uh, we'll be talking with Billy Johnson, who's the uh, chief lobbyist at ISRI, the Institute for Scrap Recycling Industries, uh, who's essentially the chief lobbyist for the recycling industry. And we'll be talking about the infrastructure bill. Oh, interesting. All right. That'll be both. Both of those will be excellent to listen to. So let's talk about April Fool's. April Fool's jokes and pranks, they can be fun. I'm not actually a fan of them, but they can be fun. But it is no fun to be fooled as a consumer and recycler. So we I want to talk today about some ways to fight off bad information and attempts to fool you. And the first we thought we'd talk about green myths and truths. And this is coming from an article that was on our uh, earth911.com website, uh, Eight Ways to Not Get Tricked While Going Green. So let's open it up. 
I'll start. One of the first ones that is kind of a trick and kind of confusing, and we had an um, earthling question on this just the last time, and that's the question of um, being told, don't worry, this is biodegradable, or don't worry, this is compostable. Um, what do you guys think about that? Does that sort of take away all your concerns? Everything is fine as long as it's compostable or biodegradable? God, no. <laughs> and why do you say that, Mitch? Well, the, the problem is that uh, compostable, let's say compostable, for example, compostable may require that it be in an industrial compost facility rather than your backyard compost facility. So there's, it's not entirely clear what compostable means. Mm-hmm. Uh, and likewise, biodegradable doesn't necessarily mean that the material will break down entirely under normal circumstances. Um, and in some cases, you might have a mix of biodegradable and other materials. And so even what does break down leaves bad stuff behind. Uh, and because product manufacturers can combine the various labels uh, in promiscuous ways, I don't think that you can re- uh, rely on either of those um, designations unless you do your homework. Mm-hmm. You know, I have seen at um, restaurants, and for example, there's a chain of uh, drive-ins uh, in our area called Dick's, Dick's uh, Drive-ins, and they have... Um, canisters out in front and that they very clearly label with pictures of what is compostable, what Mm -hmm. is um, recyclable, and what is trash. And they're really good. And they, I would trust, because they're a big enough operation that they can probably, you know, they're probably taking it to a commercial uh, composting facility. But yeah, other than that, I, I I don't think it's very helpful. Okay. Sarah, what do you guys think? Just because something says it's compostable doesn't mean that it has sustainable ingredients in it as well. So it can still be made with um, with inputs that require quite a few resources. Like if something's grown with corn, it could still have quite a few pesticides applied, you know, a huge water footprint, mm-hmm. lots of chemical fertilizers. So I think some things that that sound green, like when you think corn, you don't necessarily think petroleum-based fertilizers, mm-hmm. but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually a sustainable input. Right, or the, or the, how much water corn requires. Mm-hmm. And genetically modified seeds. I think for me, a lot of it comes down to looking at the waste hierarchy pyramid. And for those who haven't seen it before, um, it's actually inverted. So it looks more like a funnel than a pyramid. But basically at the top, you have all the waste that we generate and then various ways you can divert them. And everything we're talking about here is at the very bottom, like the smallest part, portion of the funnel, whether it's recyclable, biodegradable, compostable. So we need to do a better job as a society about getting stuff out of the stream before any of that even happens, because it really shouldn't be everything ends up in one of those three categories. Well, you're really you're hitting on an important point, which is you can't just relax and trust everybody to take care of this. This is an active participant um, project. All of us need to be involved. Absolutely. What about so here's another um, green myth, and that is organic is better. What do you think about that? Uh, for, For me, I don't buy a lot of organic food. I know it's healthier. I know a lot of people do Um, the the main part of the article is especially if you aren't eating the skin Mm -hmm. um it's it's a lot more important about where you're buying the material because if you end up buying organic bananas that come from mexico and you live in tacoma there was a lot of transportation involved in that whereas could they have grown non-organic bananas right down the street that you're not gonna eat the skin anyway so the chance you're gonna get the pesticide uh in, in your body is, is a lot less likely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And again, can't be lazy and assume that organic takes care of everything. You have to look at the full life cycle of the organic product from where it, where it was grown to how it was delivered to you. Um, if it was trans, you know, if it was transported in a completely carbon neutral way, for instance, it, that would be okay if it came from Mexico, but it's not. And so at this point we need to be very, uh, skeptical of any claims that something is is good simply because it's labeled organic. Well, let me ask you something about that, Mitch. I mean, it just that sort of makes me curious. Do you think, is there a way that something could be transported from Mexico in a carbon neutral way? Asking yeah, as an avocado today, lover. Maybe, but uh, in the long term, I'm absolutely certain of it. Okay. Um, we could use electric vehicles uh, right. that were uh, run on renewable energy. 
Um, so, you know, in the era of the Tesla truck, for instance, oh. those could be very, very efficient um, from an environmental perspective. Uh, but uh, we're not doing it now. Not doing it now. Nope. Another thing that concerns me, too, is you don't necessarily know what the working conditions are like in yeah. some of these countries, even if something is certified organic. Like people still might not be making a living wage and, mm-hmm. and yep. things like that. And kind of getting back to what Trey was talking about, some non-organic foods have a higher residue of pesticides than others. Like there's actually a list called the Dirty Dozen, Mm -hmm. and I try to really avoid those when they're not organic. You know, things like strawberries and apples that tend to have more pesticide residue than other crops. Mm -hmm. You know, mango, for example, or or banana tend to have less pesticide residue. And then there's also the impacts on the environment. So it's not just us eating, you know, consuming these pesticides, but they're also, they end up in waterways and cause contamination in other ways too, beyond just our bodies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the waste itself becomes a, a problem because of the pesticides. Right. Well, here's another one, and this is one of my favorites. I grew up in a household where there was a, always a debate Um, is it better to adjust the thermostat or keep it at a constant level? And similar, what was in my household was a debate over, is it better to turn the lights off every time you leave the room or just leave them on because the thought was that turning things on and off was going to create more power usage than just leaving them alone? I wouldn't say that it necessarily creates more power usage, but I know CFL lights have a shorter lifespan when they're turned off and on a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think to some extent, it's also good to be strategic about where different types of bulbs are used. For example, if it's a bathroom or something where you turn it on and off quite often, like an LED mm-hmm. light might be a good option. Mm-hmm. But as far as turning down the thermostat, I would I would definitely recommend that, especially for people that are out of the home for hours at a time. Right. They actually yeah, even have that. Wi-Fi enabled thermostats now too, where um, it's like with programmable thermostats, you can set them and say, oh, I'll probably be home at five from work. Um, but then maybe you decide to go out after work. So there's even Wi-Fi enabled thermostats where you can adjust the settings while you're out of the home as well, which I think is, is an exciting technology. I think another one people aren't aware of, uh, especially it's huge in Arizona during our warm summers, we have a lot of ceiling fans and people think, oh, I'll just leave it on all day and it'll cool the room down. Mm -hmm. The reality is ceiling fans do nothing to actually adjust the temperature of the room. They just blow air uh, toward you and make you feel cooler. So you really should turn off your ceiling fans when you're not in a room because they don't actually do anything to help your temperature of your house. I, the, I think the other thing to be conscious of is what time of the day you're using your electricity. It, it, it's as, as important as the idea of when you would turn on and off the lights. Uh, if, if it's the middle of the afternoon from 3 to 6 p.m., there's a heavy load on the system. That means that they're going to fall back on, if they're using primarily renewables, they may fall back on coal to, to boost their production during that time because you have to keep a balance on the grid. Uh, so, I, I, you know, we, we keep our house quite cold and we generally turn off all our lights uh, except for the ones that are in you know important areas um, where you would fall over in our house if mm-hmm. you were walking uh, so let's take one of these other myths uh, I'll take two of them first of all planting trees will solve it no matter what your problem is if you plant some trees that'll offset whatever damaging thing you're doing what do you think This was definitely huge in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Um, I would always read about the Super Bowl, which is one of the the highest travel uh, events in America. And the NFL would basically offset as much of the travel as possible by planting trees. And it, it seems good in practice. It's just that you're basically trying to offset a bunch of damage you've already done by uh, a very minor thing. I mean, trees yeah. are great, but it, it's not going to to absorb all the carbon you've already put into the environment. And I think that it, the important point here is that it has to be systematic if you're going to go about land management as a carbon capture strategy. Just doing a bunch of replanting of trees um, without consistent strategy will 
get you less results than a good land management process would. And so we've had a number of interviews with people who are strong advocates of, of primarily reforesting and reclaiming for um, uh, wild growth uh, currently abandoned land. A lot of farmers have just had to give up their land, not only because of global warming, but because of economics. And they, are, they, they advocate for doing this in a systematic way that could have a vast impact. But that's a that's also a vast expense. It's not something that the Super Bowl is going to solve by doing what they do every year to Trey's point. Mm -hmm. So I, I would not knock planting trees, but planting trees is only one part of a solution. And we need to do carbon capture. We need to reduce the amount of carbon we're producing. Uh, there is no silver bullet for climate change. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? I mean, on the one hand, I really appreciate that people are talking about this and sort of thinking about if I do something that has some impact, can I do something to counter it? Uh, I think that's a very positive thing. But I also think that it's been offered up, uh, and uh, Trey's right, I think it's a little bit out of date, but it's been sort of offered up as an easy solution to everything, you know, that, well, that we can solve things this way. Yeah, the other thing is people tend to treat uh, carbon credits as tradable uh, rather than as permanent sequestration. So you may actually simply be paying to offset somebody else's carbon production, not not your own. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so there's a lot of accounting misdirection that uh, can be involved in how much carbon you're really offsetting of your use. Another uh, thing to consider kind of along the lines of what you were talking about, Mitch, with having a more holistic strategy, like the, the species of the trees that are planted is also mm -hmm. important. Like, mm -hmm. are they native species? Do they encourage a healthy ecosystem overall? Are they... Yep. Is there a variety of trees to support a variety of species? Because they, they might still capture some of that carbon, but then there's also the impact on larger ecosystems to take into account. Yeah, if you've got a, if you've got a, a set of trees that don't create a, a good canopy, you have potentially a very bare uh, ground cover, just grass. Uh, mm. that's, that's also how you get wildfires. Um, so you're going to want the right mix and and. and I just can't imagine the Super Bowl is thinking that way. They're just thinking in terms of volume. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of trees planted. Ooh, must be good. Well, there's more to it than that. And that's that's the problem that everybody has at every layer in our society. Um, they don't fully understand their impact or what they can do to offset what they're doing. Well, and I think this brings us to the last myth, and that is that, you know, either it's so complicated or it's such a big problem Maybe I just, just shouldn't bother. Maybe I might as well just do nothing. <laughs> I mean, I, and, and I'll start to say, this is this is an easy way to feel. I mean, I, I can't tell you that I haven't felt this way myself at times thinking, you know, I, I give up. I just can't. So, I just can't do it. But what I truly believe and what I think that we see again and again is that you even a small act can make a difference. So even if you switch out your shampoo bottle for a shampoo soap bar, even if you you know, switch out your dental floss for a, a, a glass container of dental floss. I mean, everything you do has an impact. And the more you do and the more you spread it, the bigger the impact is. You know, we did a, 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 a wrap up of our first year of, serve, of uh, quizzes, environmental quizzes, and uh, collected the uh, 10 questions from the year that we felt were most representative. And one of them, uh, the ans answer was the question had to do with whether or not it was worthwhile to do this. Uh, do recycling. And the an one answer was, what, me worry? Um, out of the thousand people who responded, exactly one picked that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think everybody is aware of the fact they need to do more. And I hope that one was a joke. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's, you know, I, 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 as I recently talked about on the podcast, uh, you know, buying an electric vehicle for the two days that I drive unfortunately, two hours each way, uh, I'm offsetting something on the order of 34,000 pounds of carbon a year. Wow. Um, and, and while that is not going to change the world, if everybody did that, we would be reducing our carbon load by roughly a quarter because transportation plays such a large role in our carbon output. So I think everything that we can do will add up. But what we don't have is a system where we can see how our contribution fits in. Mm-hmm. And I think with really any big problem, it can seem overwhelming. So you just kind of start in steps. You know, if somebody has a lot of debt or they're obese and they really want to take those things on, you know, throwing up your hands isn't going to get anything done. But saying, OK, I'll 
I'll start at this point, I'll start working out twice a week or, you know, you kind of start with baby steps and, Mm -hmm. and look at some of the places where you can make the biggest impact without having a huge sacrifice and, and take things from there. I said that to the point about measurement, we measure so much more than we used to. And so it's beginning to be possible to really understand what our individual contribution is. Uh, you know, I mean, we had a, an article this week on a, on a new smart water bottle that tracks how much water you're drinking. It can tell the difference between when you're drinking from the bottle or just pouring it out, like when you're emptying it in the sink. But the other thing that they do with that measurement, besides helping you be hydrated, is they give an ounce of water to charity water for every ounce of water their customers consume. So by drinking and measuring, we also facilitate solving water problems for people on the other side of the planet. So we we have new tools emerging to link together all of these activities into some meaningful indication of whether or not we're doing a good job. And just like losing weight, uh, we can lose our carbon footprint. You know, one other thing I wanted to talk about uh, when we were sort of talking about not being fooled is I wanted to ask Sarah about this idea of uh, some companies uh, coming to residential homeowners and offering them solar leasing packages rather than um, the homeowner buying solar uh, panels. Uh, mm-hmm. at which, And I hadn't heard of this before, but uh, Sarah, um, tell us a little bit about what this is and what consumers need to be worried about. Yeah, this was something that, that we were seeing a lot um, a, several years ago, and it's actually declined a lot in popularity, but it's basically the option to lease solar panels for your roof instead of buying them. And so the solar panels would be owned by a third party, by the solar installer or an investor, and then the homeowner could buy the solar electricity. And they could often buy it actually at a discounted rate. So the concept isn't necessarily a bad one, um, but it did create some issues. Like, for example, um, when if somebody wanted to sell the home, it often made it harder to sell the home hmm. and like to transfer the lease, like the the new buyer would have to have good enough credit to be able to take over the lease and things like that. So it definitely had some logistical issues. And oftentimes homeowners save more money when they own the system. So even if they don't have the $15,000 or whatever amount of money laying around to buy the system, it often makes more sense for them financially to borrow the money Mm -hmm. because then the homeowner can also get the federal tax credit for the solar system. Mm -hmm. So, um, so they were actually often missing out on some of the financial advantages of buying the solar system. So I guess I would just recommend if, if somebody is considering a solar lease, just to look at the whole, the whole cost and, you know, all the, the benefits and all the costs involved to make more of an informed decision. Mm -hmm. And and you have to be careful with any, uh, and when you're dealing with any um, party that's really working on heavy sales, you know, sometimes things that sound like they're too good to be true, you know, as we say again and again, uh, they often are. Yeah. And really when selecting any contractor, you know, if you're going to have plumbing work done, it's a good idea to find out about their reputation or find out if they have certifications or things like that. And I would definitely recommend that for Mm -hmm. people going solar, like there's a NABCEP certification. Um, And so people that have this certification have demonstrated a certain level of knowledge. So things like that help create more, more trust and, and knowing more what quality of, of contractor they are. Mm Mm-hmm. Very good. In my experience, you're more likely to get approached by a solar leaser than a solar uh, seller. So mm-hmm. in Arizona, we have a lot of people that go door to door, ringing doorbells and ask people if they want to lease solar panels on their roof. And they might not even realize they could buy them. So mm-hmm. it's, it's this thing where if you wait for somebody to come to you, you're probably more likely to get somebody who's going to lease them to you than sell them to you. That's interesting. The next thing we want to talk about, let's talk about greenwashing. Um, this is another way of sort of fooling the consumers. And Trey, uh, you had some good information on greenwashing, but could you start by telling our listeners what is it? Yeah, so greenwashing, I like to say that it really 
started or, or hit its mainstream peak after the Al Gore's Incon- Inconvenient Truth in 2006. And I'm probably biased there because uh, I started working at Earth 911 in 2007, and I saw this huge interest in green issues that I was told wasn't really there prior to the release of that issue or that movie that made it a mainstream issue. But what basically was happening is a lot of companies wanted to tie into this consumer interest in going green um, by marketing their products to that audience. So it could be as simple as them adding green coloring to their packaging. It could be them using buzzwords like biodegradable, compostable, recyclable that we talked about earlier. Just any way that they could kind of market to consumers that their products were greener than others. And in fact, Gore's own investments were often, they weren't greenwashing investments because I, I think he takes it seriously. But, you know, his waterless toilet uh, became a, a buzzword in industry in turn, it, as an example of the kinds of positioning you could do of the product. Even though it was green in and of itself, what the other companies learned is by positioning something as green, maybe not actually green, but positioning it that way, they were more successful. And so um, it, it had some negative re- uh, uh, outcomes as well as uh, positive in terms of raising consumer awareness. And to Trey's point, uh, companies jumped all over the idea without actually embracing it. And I think that continues to be the challenge for sustainability operations within in every company. They often have no budget. And if you want to communicate to your customers about how green you are, you've got to go talk to the marketing people. And mm-hmm. then we're into selling instead of simply living and, and being sustainable in our business. Absolutely. And uh, it really, uh, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, actually released a series of guidelines called the Green Guides. Um, they originally released back in the 90s, but the most recent revision was in 2012. And we started to see the FTC crack down from that 2007, um, up until really uh, 2017. Um, they were regularly fining companies that were putting out these claims they couldn't back up. Like if they said that the product was recyclable and they couldn't show any evidence that the majority of consumers could recycle their product, or if they had a paint that they said was low VOCs, low volatile organic compounds, and they couldn't show any scientific data that backed that up, the FTC could uh, find them. They could force them to reprint the packaging or even recall the product, which we're talking millions of dollars Mm -hmm. if you get that hit on you. So uh, companies are starting to be more strategic and more responsible with their messaging as a result. One message that I see, especially on food labels, though, that I find quite concerning is all natural. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you read the ingredients, they're not very natural. Or I believe things that are labeled as natural flavors can have quite a few things that you or I might not necessarily consider natural. So that's one that I find really tricky. Just because something says it's natural, it might not be your or my definition of natural. Right. You know, I think consumers can be can keep track of some of this by using uh, CSR hubs uh, ratings, and it's something that we've continued to to integrate into reporting on Earth Nine One One. But you know, let's take exa- for example um, Amazon. Amazon does certainly try to p- present itself as green, but its environmental rating on a scale of a hundred is twenty nine. Oh, that's not and very good, is it? So if you do a little bit of research, you can find out whether a company is is living it or simply talking it. And uh, so check out CSRHub.com as a, as a handy resource. They'll let you do searches on the highest level rankings they have, which in- integrate the social responsibility. So labor conditions, uh, uh, representativeness on their board and so forth, in, in addition to the environmental score, which we are seeking to expose more often as well. Mm-hmm. And to Sarah's point, look at ingredients, too, because they can't lie about the ingredients in their product. So if you start seeing things that you know aren't natural, that's something to be set a red flag off in your head. Well, but, you know, that's just it. We don't necessarily know as consumers. And so the first step is to to kind of vet the company uh, and then vet the individual products for the company that the company makes. So you may find that somebody that some brand has a very green product and that they hang their entire green marketing on that but everything else is not. And so those are the kinds of uh, distinctions we need to make as consumers that we aren't currently used to. And and certainly technology can help us do that more efficiently too. 
Mm-hmm. Ingredient labels can get incredibly complex too, like especially when I'm looking for personal care products. Sometimes I'll look at something and think, wow, that sure sounds toxic. But mm-hmm. then I'll go to the Environmental Working Group website and realize that it's lavender oil extract or something mm-hmm. that, that indeed is probably just fine. So sometimes these labels can get so difficult to decipher, but there are resources out there that help make it easier. But then sometimes I feel like I spend 15 minutes just trying to pick out shampoo because right. I'm like doing in-depth research on, on cancer in, stuff. In a store aisle. Right. Yeah. Well, my concern about the greenwashing is when it is intentionally in, um, aimed at consumers to fool them. So my example is we have a liquefied natural gas uh, project being built in Tacoma and the advertising coming out for it, you know, that you see on social media particularly simply says, you know, this is, you know, to move Tacoma to a cleaner future uh, or, you know, when you get into details, you know, this is a bridge fuel to the future. You know, it's not the answer forever, but it's much better than the diesel bunker fuel we're using now. So it's great. And at, at no, you know, the... Probably the more accurate statement is, you know, the natural gas has a lot of issues with it, including how it's harvested, how it's, you know, piped, transported, transported yeah. then how it's refined. And it's not clean. Uh, it's not a bridge fuel. And it's not actually going to make any difference to Tacoma uh, because Tacoma already has the ships um, using uh, electric power when they're in dock and, and the um, bunker fuel is burned sort of outside Tacoma as the ships, you know, are uh, going up to Alaska. But, you know, it's just, it's a bold statement of fact, and it's very difficult um, to counter that. Uh, very, very difficult. So, Trey, tell us about how uh, Earth 911 used to deal with this, because I, th- this is part of our history that I think it would, you know, I would love to mine for uh, inspiration in the future as well. Yeah, so for those who aren't aware, uh, Earth911 maintains the largest directory in America of where you can recycle. Everything from curbside programs to retail drop-off sites to private businesses that will accept material from consumers. And um, starting in in 2007 and really uh, hitting hitting its stride in 2011, we worked with the U.S. Census to identify the population of every zip code and every city and every county in America and then tie that into access to recycling, whether it's uh, curbside access, because you knew how many many individuals in each city had access to the curbside program or drop-off within city or county or zip code limit. And what we could then do is identify a percentage of Americans that had access to recycle a given product. So what we would do is take that material ID in the directory and then run it across the entire population and say, okay, for material X, 47% of Americans can recycle it curbside, uh, 55% can recycle it within their city drop off and, and what have you. So we were actually working with companies who wanted to validate their claims about is my product recyclable because the FTC is asking me if I'm putting some sort of messaging on there like, this product is recyclable. I need to back it up. Mm-hmm. And and so, if you see somebody making that claim today, how would you a, a company making that claim today that they they pass sixty percent of the homes, which is the threshold for being able to put a recycling uh, uh, label on your on your product? Do you take that at face value or not? I, I think the trick of saying today is tough because. We haven't even seen any green guides violations in the past year plus. Um, I think when we deregulate the uh, economy, part of that is going to be resulting where there's going to be less of a concern about companies making these claims. Um, So I would say that there are a lot of ways to come up with a number. Um, I feel more confident in the way Earth 911 was doing it because we had all the data, not just extrapolating on a percentage of the population and trying to uh, prorate that out to cover the entire United States. Well, I think we should try to begin to tackle that again. Um, this is all part of how we are uh, revivifying the, the database. And, and But, you know, the, the challenge here is how do we do something that is genuinely a public good and not tied to the uh, financial goals of all these companies solely? 
So uh, if folks out there have ideas, I would love to hear alternative approaches to financing these kinds of things. Part of our new let's solve a problem approach. Uh, recycling needs a lot of solutions, and hopefully we can catalyze them. Mm-hmm. Well, and on that uh, sort of more taking control side, um, what are some positive ways that you as a consumer or uh, a homeowner or a, an investor or an interested person can take control? How are some ways that you can gain information in addition to using the resources at the earth911.com website? Uh, Sarah, you had an article uh, sort of around the end of the year about socially responsible investing. Um, is is that a good way that you can sort of feel like you're a little bit more assured that you're getting um, good information and making good decisions? Yeah, I think socially responsible mutual funds are a good start because they have filters. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if you don't want to own any stocks in tobacco or firearms companies, you can buy into these mutual funds that have those filters The only thing, though, is I don't think unless they have really kind of strict filters, you're probably, you know, I think there might be some misnomers out there that that means that all your stocks will be in solar panel manufacturers and things like that. It's not necessarily that green, but Mm -hmm. it I think it does filter out, you know, kind of the worst of the worst that that people might be supporting but aren't even aware that they are. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, there's actually I've seen uh, in Washington state, there's actually a um, a state sponsored um, investment index uh, for investing in green projects in the state of Washington. So these things are also starting to emerge at the grassroots or at least at the state level. Absolutely. That's good. Yeah, it's not a new concept. So it's it's been around for a while and a lot of organizations are now yeah. have some sort of social filter. And, and, and the uh, sustainable portfolios tend to, per, to perform about 5 to 7% better than the market overall. So there are plenty of incentives for an investor who wants to put their money to work in the right way. But again, we have to be careful about what exactly those funds are, are investing in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does make sense from a financial standpoint that if, if companies are doing things that create financial liabilities, you know, excessive dumping and things like that, that it can really come back to, to bite them Mm -hmm. uh, financially. So it makes sense to reduce environmental liabilities to improve financial performance. Well, you know, and Trey mentioned the fact that we have deregulated our economy, which is a a tragedy. Um, But the, the perfect example of seeing deregulation go too far is the Boeing 747 max problem. They were allowed to test their own product uh, and and put it out without any federal oversight to speak of. And as a result, um, 700 people are dead. Uh, and there are, uh, they're going to have to rebuild those planes to some extent, at least the software. Uh, you don't want to support a company that's going to make those kinds of choices. You want to look for a company that is seeking to collaborate with society to find sustainable outcomes, not just to make the most money they can. Mm-hmm. Well, the last question I had for you guys was if there was one particular false claim or uh, example of greenwashing that you could just get rid of, wave your magic wand, make it stop, what would it be? What is sort of the one most egregious or or the thing that bothers you the most? Sarah, what about you? Probably the one I said before when things are – when personal care or food products Mm. are – labeled natural like I know a lot of personal care products have synthetic fragrances in them and from from what I've read a lot of these are just sort of a toxic soup Mm. and then you end up putting it you know on your hair or on your skin or things like that and breathing them and absorbing them into our bodies so I think a lot of personal care products in particular seem a lot more natural than they really are Mm -hmm. and and that claim of being natural just kind of makes me cringe sometimes. Yeah. Trey, what about you? What What's the one thing that if you could uh, directly get rid of it, what would you do? To me, it's any messaging about end of life. I mean, especially what we talked about at the very beginning, the biodegradable versus mm. compostable versus recyclable. I, I feel like people put those on packaging to make consumers feel better about buying them because consumers have to be the ones to make the decision about what to do with it when they're done with it. And 
those messages are, are so mixed up and skewed right now that I, I wish they weren't used the way they were on packaging. Yeah. What about you, Evelyn? Well, so I was actually thinking sort of the, the big giant one, and that is just the um, that uh, climate change or global warming doesn't exist. I just wish we could move past that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I hope that the weather is proving to people that that is a, a reality. But, uh, you know, I, so I'll add mine, and it is also sort of at the holistic level, and that is the building on what Trey just said. The whole idea that if you're not actively engaged in in making and uh, exercising your own judgments about what your footprint should be, including what you're buying and what happens to it over the course of its entire lifetime, uh, that everything will be okay uh, because companies are going to step in and take care of companies just like people are capable of all sorts of subterfuge and misleading statements. Um, And unless consumers hold them to it, Uh, to the commitment by not spending their money with them if they violate it. Uh, We're we're simply condemning ourselves to a a very slow roasting by the planet. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure that's the most positive note to end on, but... Let's hey. <laughs> let's move over to Earthling questions because there's a couple of these that are actually um, quite intriguing. Um, and the first one, I, I it just raises to me a lot of questions. But Mike on Facebook asks, he says, "Hello. In the past, I've used a company called Quality Farms in Dayton, Ohio, to destroy old beer in cases for me. That company seems to have gone out of business. I'm looking for a way to have about." 1,500 to 2,000 cases of beer destroyed. I do not want to just dump them down the drain and was hoping to find another facility to send it to. So I don't know what Mike does, but he does something with a heck of a lot of beer. Um, What sort of heresy is this? I know. That's (laughs) that's a lot of beer to need to destroy, but maybe... maybe, 480,000 bottles of beer. Oh, my gosh. Maybe it goes... Maybe it's gone bad. Maybe he's a distributor. I don't know. But anyway, what what advice do we have for Mike? This is representative of the problem that a lot of businesses have is that they don't have simple or widely available ways to dispose of products in a a sustainable way. Uh, And a lot of it ends up in landfills. Um, I, I, it, it, and it's tragic. Uh, one of the things I think uh, we need as a society is a clearinghouse for this kind of information. And again, this is another thing I continually think about how we might be able to facilitate, but it doesn't exist today in any convenient way. Um, um, search on the web is not the answer to this problem by itself. Mm-hmm. It, you know, well, I'm th- one of Earth Island One's former sister companies, Quest Recycling Services, they actually were really good at these types of things. I don't know if they specify it in, in alcohol specifically, but they would partner with uh, businesses and retailers to connect them with uh, proper waste disposal outlets. So yeah. there are they are still actually a partner in Earth 911. So uh, it, it isn't a former sister company. They are one of our owners now. Hmm. Fair enough. So what I would wonder about is if um, Mike is in Ohio, I wonder if there's some... Um, animal feed or um, large farming cooperative mm-hmm. that would like to take the beer and mix it with um, their feed either for um, pigs or uh, cattle if they've got a grain mash or horses or something like that because the beer, unless there's something really wrong with it, uh, you know, if it's just past its sell-by date, it's a, a very nutritional product and I would think that there might be some benefit to it. Yeah, that's a great that's a great idea. Uh, and then the, the the challenge would be then what to do with the four hundred and eighty thousand bottles. Yeah, uh, we need to find a glass recycler who can work in concert with the uh, whoever processes the uh, beer into the mash. Yeah. Now, if they're in cans, that's a little bit easier because the aluminum is more easily uh, recycled. Mm-hmm. But yeah, either uh, cans or glass. So that would be your challenge, Mike is to either you do this or put a staff member on this challenge of finding a way to coordinate um, both the containers and the contents. But I I would look into the farming and and feed industry. I think that might be an option. If the beer hasn't expired, I wonder if donation is an option as well. I wonder if there's a a law about donating beer. Um, I I bet there's some overhead in terms of will this get to children – 
and that sort of thing. And food safety law too. Yeah. Yeah, or even liability. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It might be hard to find an organization that wants that, many. that much beer. That's a lot of beer. That's a lot of beer. That is a ton of beer. It may actually be a literal multiple ton of beer. Actually be. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Uh, so the next one is, uh, this is intriguing too. Christy in Petaluma, California asks, I have a lot of polar pack freezer gel packs. Where can I find a business or organization that will take these? Ray, this one sounded like one for you. That's why I picked it. <laughs> I'm not really familiar with polar pack freezer gel packs specifically. Um, what I found a lot of times with these uh packaging materials the manufacturer does have some sort of take back program if you're willing to send them in because most of the stuff is very reusable um so i would contact polar pack and see what they suggest additionally these are donatable uh and so take it to uh your local um habitat or uh saint vincent de paul um there may be any number of food charities in your area that need to keep donations cool or, or deliveries cool. Mm-hmm. So maybe uh, Meals on Wheels in your, in your uh, region as well could use these uh, in their daily work. Yeah, I was also thinking that uh, maybe your local veterinarian's uh, office might be interested in them, depending on how many uh, gel packs you have. Um, that it, all of these, especially small businesses, they just have to buy this stuff. So yeah. sometimes, if you can hook up with a small business um, and they don't have to, you know, if they don't have to buy a hundred gel packs a month, you know, if you've got a lot of gel packs that you can give to them, that's a huge help for them. And sort of takes it off of you uh, in a in a very pleasing, guilt free way. And and in Christie's case, Petaluma is very close to wine country, so all those wineries see if they're willing to take them as well. Oh, that's a really good idea. All right, next one. Rosemary on Facebook asks: this is, She looked at a recent article about uh, using soil solarization for weed control on our earth nine one one dot com website, and she says you suggested using plastic to solarize gardens in the spring. What other materials will work? Because I hate plastic. I don't know that another material would have the exact same effect. Like if you use black plastic, it actually absorbs a lot of heat and almost. It kills off weeds, I think, partially because of heat, but mm-hmm. also partially from blocking out the sun's rays. I've I've used cardboard before, too, and that works pretty well, but I think that mostly works by just keeping everything dark so the plants can't grow. But I've also used, you know, if her aversion to plastic is creating new plastic, I've taken tarps that have been torn or are basically useless and used old tarps as well or even garbage bags that have been damaged where there's not really another use for it. So if it's more of a waste reduction vision, there might be ways to use plastic where you're not using virgin plastic too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had, I had a dialogue with Rosemary uh, about this and pointed out that what we were suggesting is that this is a great way to reuse plastic, not to go out. You shouldn't go out and buy this stuff in order to, uh, to solarize your, your uh, garden. But uh, she also suggested, in addition to uh, uh, what you did, uh, newspaper and mulched leaves as alternatives. But again, I'm not sure that that is a, uh, a solid solution to killing the weeds. It may simply be a way of, of uh, feeling good about it, but doing something that doesn't have a, su- a substantial effect on your need for pesticide or herbicide later. Yeah, I think that mulching will definitely, I mean, it certainly improves your soil, and I think it will help with some of the weeds, um, you know, the the ones that sort of are more surface weeds, but I don't know that it will do much about the deeper weeds, that, you know, because that's the heat piece of the of the dark plastic. I was wondering, too, if you could get, if like a really black canvas or something would do something similar, but that... Uh, I don't think that builds up the same heat as a as a plastic, which doesn't allow for any breathability. Yeah. So it's a, it's an open question uh, whether or not there are other materials that will work as well. Um, certainly, if you are that averse to plastic, um, you can try alternatives. Uh, and we, cer- we 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 encourage people to share their ideas. Uh, if there's a better idea out there, we want to hear it. Yeah, Put it in the, uh, the, the Earthling Forum and let's talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. So listeners out there, if you've got a really great way of getting rid of weeds without using plastic and without using pesticides, we are very interested in that. 
And if she doesn't have an old tarp plane around, it might be possible to find one, you know, like on Craigslist or Facebook. Like now there's more and more groups where people share resources, especially if it's torn or unusable in some mm-hmm. ways. Next door is another good uh, network to get on for that kind of stuff. I'm finding a lot of people sharing garden equipment and uh, giving away extra stuff uh, on next door in my community. That's great. Uh, any other thoughts on um, things to be aware of, false claims, greenwashing, ways that we get fooled before we wrap up? Well, you know, I, instead of instead of that, uh, because I, I, I was such a downer before, mm-hmm. I want to remind people that right now is the best time to plant native vars, uh, uh, pollinator-friendly, uh, locally uh, appropriate plants. The milkweed for monarch butterflies in your area, not just any milkweed. Look it up. Uh, adding clover for bees and hummingbirds. Uh, it, it's that time of the year, and we can make our backyards uh, and our gardens, if they are container gardens or in a windowsill, part of a, a more natural environment by planting uh, local native art. That is a very positive way to end. So mm-hmm. you can create your own Eden in your backyard, make it earth-friendly, and uh, good luck with that. So that's all we have for this episode. As always, we really appreciate your suggestions and feedback. Send us an email. You can send it to feedback at earth911.com. And you can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, YouTube, all the places. Plus, of course, at our earth911.com website. We will see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.